Pastor here, uh, welcome. I'm sure you've already been welcome when you came in. Uh, we hope that you uh, uh, came prepared to hear God's word today. We really base everything we do on God's word. We literally uh, run everything through the filters of what the Bible says. And so, because what we believe is that it is life changing, it is it is able to transform you from the inside out. And so, uh, we don't have everything perfect. But we do serve a God who is perfect, and He's trying to perfect us. And so He just wants to um, you to lean in today and, and hear His Word today. And we feel like that uh, we're going to see more life change. We've got some real momentum around here. I don't know if you've looked around lately, but the past couple of months, man, there's people not just growing in number, but growing spiritually. People are giving their life to Jesus. They want to know what His plan is for their life. And so all we do here at Revolution Church, this is our phrase, is that we like to help move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. We want to be a part of that process. So we hope you'll join us. Some of you have already decided this is where I want, I want to call this my church home. We'd love to talk with you about that. But um, we're in this series, and it's called Hills and Valleys. And I really meant for it to end last week. I really did. And then uh, we just had so many people that were... Um, present for some of those those messages and it yeah and, and it and it was some life change going on e even for me I mean especially for me uh, as I was preparing man it's really moving and working in my life and so we decided to extend it at least one more week and so uh, I'm glad you showed up and I'm glad that you got to see a little bit about our students man they you know we've got the best student leaders on the planet don't we listen and here's the good news they are just now hitting their stride. They are, they are, they, that even, it isn't even the best. Our, our, our best is ahead of us. And listen, I'm going to tell you, when you're looking for a church, when you're trying to find out, if you're trying to settle in, whether your kids are already grown or you're never going to have kids, you better check the pulse of the student ministry, and that's how healthy the church is. It just is. Okay? Thank you for valuing the, the, the our students and our children. Um, um, we're able to do things because of your generosity, because of your willingness to give faithfully. That allows us to do good and great and big things. So thank you for that. Thank you for AJ and Heather. Listen, and they'll be the first to tell you, before they ever talk about themselves, is the people that help them in student ministry. They are awesome. And as a former student pastor myself, it counts on who's around you. And so uh, they're quick to acknowledge that. So we're, we're, we're doing great with that. So uh, if you don't know, if you've got a, a neighbor that's got a student, uh, somebody in your family, just contact Heather and AJ. They will contact. They'll, they'll find a way to get to them and communicate uh, to a path for a student ministry here and ultimately our church. But we're in this series called Hills and Valleys. And what we've been trying to do is uh, just kind of separate hills and valleys, heals those high places, those places where you're, those mountaintop experiences that we have, those where things are going well, you know, we crave those. We want that. And God wants them, wants them for us. But in this series, we're trying to not neglect the valley, not to overlook the valley, not to um, underestimate what can be learned while in the valley. And so we've, we've, taking a lot of steps there if you want to go back into our archives uh, on our website uh, we've got just about every sermon we've ever had and uh, it's called hills and valleys so we're going to continue that today because here's the deal the our enemy 
We call him the devil. We call him Satan, Beelzebub, whatever your favorite name for him is. Um, I've got a couple more. You can ask me after. Uh, but he loves to catch us in the valley. It's actually a military strategy we learned is that a lot of battles happen in the valley because, because the enemy can kind of trap you in the valley. And so while we're down, and when we say in the valley, listen, that means there's a, a spiritual meaning to that. That means maybe disconnected from God. That means numb from the things of God. That means when you're hurt spiritually, when you're hurt in any way, that's when the enemy loves to attack us while we're there. So we've got to have a strategy in place. And sometimes we put ourselves in a valley by decisions we make, things we neglect, things we overlook. So the title of my message today, if you're taking notes, is A Strategy for the Struggle. We're going to have a strategy and we're going to look at somebody, a, a character in a uh, in the Bible who we can learn from their life. But let's start with praying. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, just for this gathering, Lord. Uh, So many people here, Lord, that just want to find out, Lord, what you want for their life, God. They need steps. They need something concrete, God. They need some movement in their life. And so, God, we're going to look no other place than your word, Lord, to, to be able to look for what our next steps would be. So, God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for Jesus on the cross, Lord, that sacrifice, Lord, that that offers to pay our debt, our sin debt, God, that we could never pay ourselves, God. Help us to be sensitive, Lord, today to your word. Uh, Lord, prepare a soft heart for us, Lord, so we can absorb what you have to say for us today. God, there are people here that are broken hearted. They're having to make difficult decisions, God. They're having to, um, God, uh, go through things that they never thought they'd have to go through. So God, we know you're going to meet us right there, Lord. You don't abandon us, even when other people do. Even when our plans fall through, Lord, your plans don't. So God, we thank you for your word today. It's in Jesus' name that we're praying because it's full of authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say amen. Hand clap for your band, boy. They lead us, don't they? They are are great. They're great. This morning, I'm going to be reading out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 the whole time. Okay? I'm going to be there. And if you, you can look on our screen, you can pull up your U, uh, version app. It's pretty awesome, right? You can carry your Bible with you all day, every day. If you've got that app, that U version app. And we're going to look at the life of one of the greatest men of God ever recorded in Scripture. Just an amazing guy that, but what we're going to find out today, that he found himself in a valley. He felt numb and disconnected. He felt depressed. He felt overwhelmed and anxious. And what I was hoping is you'll be able to attach yourself to him, even though he's such a man of God, so much of his life recorded in scripture, that you'll be able to relate what he's going through. So we're going to start with verse 1, and this is what the Bible says. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with his sword. I'm only going to stop for a second to say Jezebel was not a good queen. She was nasty and mean. And she had, she actually paid. She lost money because uh, Elijah had, with his direction from God, the, these false prophets of Baal uh, were killed, 450 of them. And she's T.O.'d. She's mad about it because she's invested a lot because she would surround herself with them to tell her what a good shit job she's doing, okay, and how awesome she is. And here comes Elijah, Elijah, uh, the prophet of uh, the God of the Bible, and Elijah comes, and he, he would tell the truth about things. So she, he's kind of busting her flavor a little bit. And so Ahab came and told her everything that happened. Man, you ought to see this, Elijah. He's really cramping your style. And in verse 2, it says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to, messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me. Be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. She, what she's saying here, she said, I promise to God, I swear to God. You ever heard somebody say that? It means I, nothing's going to stop me. This is going to happen. And she's talking about her gods. And they're saying, I'm going to kill you. She's threatening him. She sent a messenger telling him that. So what, watch, watch what happens here. Verse 3 and 4 says, Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. 
when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant. Somebody had been there with him. He left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Now that's woods, okay? That's away from everything. Nothing really grows in a, a wilderness. It's a desolate place. It goes on to say, he came to a broom brush. That sounds peculiar. A broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Things are really getting low for Elijah. Things are really in a bad state. And it says, I've had enough, Lord. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever felt that way? I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. It goes on to say, then he laid down under the bush, the, the, the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel, an angel of the Lord, touched him and said, get up and eat. An angel of the Lord, what this means, a messenger of God, okay? We're not talking wings and all those type of things. It was a, a, somebody that God had placed there, an angel, and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And this ain't a Bojangles breakfast. But I'm sure he's hungry. He said he ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. The Bible says, strengthened by that food, and we've been talking as a church the last, through that this whole series is, is being strengthened, right? When we're in a valley, man, we need some strength and it comes from the Lord and he was strengthened by that food and he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb you might recognize it better as Mount Sinai some of you that's been around church a little while it's called also called the mountain of God it had a nickname the mountain of God what that means is is that God is known to frequent that high place that place that's elevated that's where God often is Verse 9 says, there, when he got to the mountain, he went into a a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him while he went to the place, the mountain of God. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What brings you here? What are you doing here? And this is what he said. He says, I've been very zealous. It means very busy, doing your work for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They're not doing like they're supposed to do, and it's real frustrating. They've torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. It was on to say, this is the Lord. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain, that high place where God's known to be, in the presence of the Lord, because on the mountain is where the presence of the Lord. He said, go there, for the Lord is about to pass by. It says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Some of your versions might say a a still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The voice said to him, he's covering because in in those days and and now God is so awesome that it might kill you just to look at him. It's overwhelming. It says when he heard he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave on the mountain. Then a voice said said to him, "Um, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. I said twice. The Lord told him, he's about to tell him right here that there's still work to be done. He's telling the Lord, this is my circumstances. This is my, the situation I'm in. It's, it's dire. I'm in a valley. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm overwhelmed. I'm looking over my shoulder. God, I'd almost rather just die. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert 
of Damascus. When you get there, anoint. Listen, some of y'all look for baby names. Here they are again. Here's what I want you to do. There's still work to be done. Here's what I want you to do. Go back. And when you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram. Also, I got more work for you to do. Anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And, and while you're at it, I got more work for you to do. Go back here and do this. Anoint Elisha. Elisha's a big swinger. He's a home run hitter in scripture. Go anoint him. Tell him he's set apart. Tell him he's got a special assignment. Go anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel. Mahola, succeed you as prophet. So I just read a whole lot of stuff, a lot of weird names. That's a lot of scripture to try to absorb. But what I hope to, for us to pull out today is that no matter what our circumstances are in life, no matter what's going on, to know that God wants to move us forward. There's always a plan to move you forward, and that's great news for us. And I think that this story, this story about Elijah, is a great example of that. Because just ahead of this, in chapter 18, I'm going to let you go back and read that. We, saw, we see some of the, the greatest moments ever recorded in the Bible. At one point, Elijah prays that fire would come down from heaven, and it did. He's one of these guys. He prayed, and then it happened. Then another time he prayed, it would rain because there had been a drought there for three years, not one drop, three years. But when he prayed, it rained. Right? This guy, has, by history, has been c- connected with God closely. And all of that happened in the, just the chapter before this one. Now, the very next chapter, chapter 19, he finds out that the queen did not care for some of the things that he had done. And she's after, after him because now she's going to kill him. So all of a sudden, he finds himself in a, in a valley, in a spiritual valley. Numb and disconnected, he's blocking out people, he is, he's worried. And so there's a big difference between chapter 18 and chapter 19. It sounds like a totally different guy, but it's the same guy. And a lot of us feel that way. This is a pretty good picture of a lot of us. We feel like sometimes, man, that we've got faith. We've got some faith. We're seeing God work in our life. We're starting to grow in certain areas. We're taking steps. Becoming more like Jesus. Then the next thing you know, everything's falling apart. Everything in life seems to be a struggle. We're isolated. We get to an all-time low. How, and you start thinking, how did I get from there to here? How did that ever happen? And some people, I, I hear them say, you know, I feel like sometimes I don't feel so, I must not be a very spiritual person if that's happening to me. When I get in a valley, a spiritual valley like that. And I want to tell you, he's one of the greatest prophets in the history of the Bible. And we find him overwhelmed and anxious and depressed. He's in a spiritual valley. So I want to give you three things. I want to show you how he got there, okay? So you can go back and study this, man. This is going to give you um, uh, some help. It's going to give you some help in the very near future. It's three things that he does to get himself in a spiritual valley. How did he get there? Because he put himself there, all right? And so here's what we're going to do. Here's the first one is that Elijah forgot about what God had done. So the first point is, I can wind up in a valley. I can get in that low place, that depressed place. When I forget about what God has done for me, God is so serious about us remembering. And he gave us a way to try to remember things. Listen, a lot of times I heard y'all clap a lot. Everything after a song, after, after AJ said some words, after these students, they were up here proclaiming the gospel is what they were doing. They were saying, God changed me. They were giving you a count, and you were quick to clap. He gave us a way, he gave us a noise connected to celebration. He wants us to celebrate what he does over and over again. Well, Richard, you don't understand. I come from a background. You didn't even burp in church. I mean, you didn't, you didn't yawn, you didn't do, do any movement. Listen, that's not a, a biblical principle. There's all kind of celebration. He wants us to remember, okay? God never wants us to forget what he's done. So sometimes we can get distant 
from God, we can feel that numbness. We're not connecting with what's being said. Something's being said here. Something's being sung here that should move you. And it should be a red flag if nothing's moving. So I want you, I'm trying to let you figure out how Elijah got there. He forgot. He stopped celebrating. He forgot about what God had done for him because he had just happened. Chapter 18 had just happened. The rain and the fire and all the amazing things that God did through him. And now, just like that, with this Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, all of a sudden he forgets everything. All he sees is what's right in front of him, and it's worrying him to death. And it takes him off track from where God wants him to be. We have this tendency to do that. I'm calling it spiritual amnesia. That's what that's going to be called from here on out, is when, man, I'll hear some people talk one week about what God had provided Man, God really came through when I needed him to. I said, well, I'll be sure to well, celebrate that. Man, that's awesome. Let me celebrate that with you. And then the very next week, something happens. And it's, woe is me. Uh, I can't believe I'm in this shape. Sometimes you'll see tears. I, I just want to point back to, hey, man, last week, God came through. God came through. Don't have spiritual amnesia. But we have this tendency about us. No matter how many good things happen in our life that God does for us or how awesome he's working when something hits us, we forget. When one bad thing happens, a doctor report comes back and it's not a good one. When a relationship goes sour in our life, whatever it is, all we can focus on is the here and now. And Jesus himself, he said, look, one of his last words to his disciples was, look, I'm going to the cross. And he's having the first communion ever. He said, look, do this. Remember me. Remember me. So that's why we do it as a church. That's why we do it, is to remember what he accomplished because we have this tendency to forget. That's why we have to have this, cultivate this attitude of gratitude. You've heard that before. We've got to be quick to celebrate and celebrate often. Help other people to celebrate when they're saying what's going on in their life. Celebrate with them. That's why life groups are important. Celebrate with them. And when they start to get down, we've got to remind, hey, 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 you just told me what God had done for you. I want to remind you of that. He wants to celebrate it. So I want you to write this down because people who are filled with gratitude tend to give thanks the most often. Watch. Pay attention from here on out. They're the people that are most filled with gratitude because they say it. Okay, something about words puts it into action. Write this down. It's hard to forget what God has done when you're always celebrating it. Really hard. I'm always celebrating. It's the first thing on my mouth. Our hands should be sore every Sunday. You should go home and say, dang, man, I can hardly pick up my fork to eat. Well, not me. But man, my hands, I've just been clapping so much, celebrating, man, remembering what God is doing. It should be like that. You know when you're in a pool too long? You look at your kid and say, it's time to get out. Why? Look at your hands. They're all pruned up. It's time to get out. Right? There should be evidence, man, (laughs) that we're celebrating that we never cease to celebrate. So, the second thing I want to tell you Elijah does to get himself in the valley. First, he forgets what God's done. Here's number two. I can wind up in a valley. I can be just like Elijah and get there too when I fear what other people think about me. Man, that puts more people in a valley than I've ever seen. They're so worried. They can't take steps. They are held hostage by fear of what other people are thinking. Or saying. He forgot all the things that, that God had done in chapter 18. And then he focused on the words of this Queen Jezebel. He's focused on. She's powerful. And I understand that's pretty scary. But he's so focused on he forgets what he's supposed to be doing for the Lord. And that's a real tendency for us. We wonder what people are saying. That fear, that insecurity. We spend so much time and effort worrying about what other people are saying that's why we're on social media so much that's why social media is so effective hey i love it i love i love seeing your life I, I like to like as much as i can if i see it i love that but there's another end to that right um, we go looking for likes we go looking to be accepted do you think i'm acceptable that's what we're saying to people when we post sometimes you don't put the worst pictures on there we put the best ones because we're worried about so much. We're obsessed about what people think instead of what God thinks in our life. And it puts us in a valley. 
And I, I just love to tell you that, look, if you're good enough that he would put his only son on the cross, then you are good enough. Is that okay? So why do we do that? Why do we refuse to do what God's called us to do because we get worried about what somebody else thinks? I thought it's too long for a tattoo, so don't try to get this as a tattoo. Don't. It's too long. Fear of men will always, meaning every time, keep you from being who God called you to be. Every time. The fear of men will keep you from it, from God's best. Because nobody ever steps into who God's called them to be when they're worried about and afraid of people. You never achieve what God has for you, what he has in mind for you, that plan. There's going to be competition for God's plan in your life. And your enemy's favorite tool is fear, particularly the fear of what everybody else thinks. So it's got Elijah in a valley. He's forgotten what God's done, and he's fearing what people thought about him. It's got him in a valley. And here's another way, the last way that I want to point out that Elijah got in a valley. And if we're not careful, it gets us in a valley. Here's the third one. I wind up in a valley when I flee from those close to me. We run away from people who are close to us. We get in that valley. That's another tool is that isolation. The enemy loves to get you by yourself. So it can outnumber you, make you feel overwhelmed. A lot of times we worry about what people think that we don't even know and sometimes don't even like. Am I right? Don't aim in that. But we distance ourselves from people that God meant to surround us with. And that's what he did. He flee. You notice all the F's here? I'm trying to bust all the F's. We'll get to it in a second. The Bible says that Elijah ran. He got scared. He got afraid for his life. And I don't know if you've been really afraid to the point that, he, that you ran. If you want to see somebody run fast, really turn on the turbo boosters. That guy is me. Get me near a haunted house and have that guy with the chain, chainsaw running out the back of the building. I run the fastest when I'm afraid. I'm not the only one to admit that. There's some other sissies in here. Oscar. Sorry. But Elijah was afraid and he ran. Because you always run faster when you're afraid. Have you ever seen people just leave and vanish? They're gone, bam. There's something that made them afraid. But this servant that he had, we don't know his name, but he kept up with him for a long time. In chapter 18, he's seen him call fire from heaven. He's like, man, he saw 450 prophets of Baal, okay, die. He saw it rain. He helped out in the process. But all of a sudden here, when Elijah needed it the most, Elijah left his servant. Somebody had always been with him, always been around. So he was probably like, here, okay, you're, you're freaking out, then maybe I should freak out because I've seen you do some awesome stuff, Elijah, and here you are freaking out. So finally, the servant kept up with him all the way to Beersheba. Beersheba. Then Elijah left him. He says, look, you've got to stay here. It's around verse 3, remember? You've got to stay here. He had been with him every single step of the way, and now he's isolating himself from the person that probably helped him the most. So if you want to end up in a valley, isolate yourself from people. That's how you get in a valley. Worry about, concern yourself with the opinions of other people. It'll get you in a valley real quick. And forget about what God has done. We all have this tendency to run. So Elijah does that. It tells us in verses 4 and 5, it says that Elijah finds himself camped out, sitting in the middle of a desert. He's all alone. Nobody's around him. And he's sitting beneath a broom tree. A broom tree. If you're wondering what a broom tree looks like, it's exactly what it sounds like. It would be a big, a bunch of sticks with a bunch of no leaves on it type of uh, bush. And that's, that's called a broom bush. They would literally break them off or cut them off, turn them upside down, and sweep. They were just born to broom, right? So all he wanted, he's in this, 
in this valley. He's in this middle of a desert. Nobody's around. He's isolated. All he wants is a little bit of shade. But all he got in the valley was this broom tree. No leaves, no shade. And he can't even find shade. And so now he's praying that God would kill him, that he would end his life. God, I've had enough. That was his words. I've had enough. This is the man that prayed for fire. He prayed for rain. And now he's praying for God to kill him. He better be careful. Because all his prayers seem to kind of happen. And he can get that bad in a hurry. I'm kidding around a little bit. But listen, you can get in that valley and it is bad. You start thinking about his life worth living. And Elijah, this man of God that's heavily documented in Scripture, he's in that very same place. I don't know if I can go on. But what it tells me is, man, that there's hope. If you felt that way, if you feel that way, that there is hope. We didn't get that bad in a hurry. And I know that there's a lot of people, how many of us have said that? I've had enough with this marriage. I've had enough with this job. I've had enough of the circumstances I'm in. I just can't do this anymore. And the Bible says that he fell asleep. So that's about the halfway point. The Bible says he fell asleep. So if you want to get in a valley, do those three things. Listen, forget, fear, and flee. That's what got Elijah in there. So some of you are, I'm trying to stay out of the valley, Richard. Tell me what to do. Well, I'm going to tell you what not to do first. That's what I just did. Don't copy Elijah here. Don't forget. Stop worrying about what other people think. Don't just remember. I would celebrate it. So celebrate and then stop worrying about people and what they think. And then flee. Not this kind of flee. Listen, God tries his best to surround you. He knows exactly who to surround you with. People that can have your ear and speak truth into your life. And some of y'all run from it. You run from it. You flee. You're not just moving off the direction. You run from like, man, God's trying to surround you with people. He wants the best for you. And a lot of times that he does his best work through other people in your life. Be careful you wind up in a valley. Some of you might be honest enough to say, hey, man, I've done all those, all those things. I'm in a place where I can't even find shade. I'm exposed. I'm alone. I'm overwhelmed. I can't make a move. I'm in a valley. It's exactly what it feels like. It's a a valley. So what do I do? Because I just didn't want to just tell you how to get in a valley. I want to tell you how to get out. That's the good news is there's a way. There are ways, man, that are uh, awesome. I would write these down. I would find a way to capture some of this, and it's going to help you get out of a valley. It's going to help you get out. So no matter where you are, listen, you're never too far from God. He's always close by. No matter how you feel, the truth is he's always within reach. He's always there. You're never too far from God. So the rest of the time, I want to give you three things. Three things that's going to help you get out of a valley or at least stay out of one as long as you can, right? So first of all, in verses 5, it may seem really simple, but here's some pieces from those verses. It says, Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. He ate and drank. And then lay down again. So he got up, verse 8, he got up and ate and drank. So the first thing we see, the first thing that we see is Elijah slept and ate and slept and ate. So if you're taking notes, you're trying to get out of the funk, trying to get out of the valley. If you want to get out of the valley, you have to learn to rest and read. Rest and read. Over and over in Scripture, there's a lot of, References in the Bible comparing God's word to food. He knows. He knows we eat. Amen. Uh, he knows we, we do that so we understand that concept that we need to eat to live. So when he's saying, look, if you think that, that's necessary to live, you you got to get a hold of my word. You got to... I, I pulled this up in Matthew 5, 6, and it's, it says this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is meaning God's way is the best way. It is God's way. People that hunger for that and want to do that, they shall be satisfied. There's something about pursuing God. And how we pursue God is through His Word. That's how we know God. That's how somebody 
taught God's word to you or spoke God's word to you. It's what changed your life. And it sustains life. He says we'll always be satisfied. So the first thing that God does is, I think literally, you need to rest, you need to sleep, you need to eat, you need to to drink. So he starts out with some physical renewal here. But here's the deal, that rest part. Rest and read. That rest part. We live in a society that values and even rewards chronic fatigue. The harder you work, the more hours you've ever seen. I work, I work 12 hours. I work 120 hours today. That's what they'll say. It's almost like they're bragging. Like, I don't know if we'll be bragging about it, but, um, but because we value that. I mean, you're a hard worker when you do that. You're trying to provide for your family. We get that. But the Bible says that we need rest. God knew that one of the things that we would need would be rest. And Elijah says in, uh, uh, in 1 Kings 19, he says, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. Zealous means busy. Busy and excited about, about you, God. He's, he's excited about it, and he's, he's busy. It means how he's dedicated his life to it. And we've got to learn to run, you know, when it's time to run. We've also got to learn when it's time to rest. God's really serious about it. And one of the Ten Commandments says to keep the Sabbath holy. It's a day of rest, a day that we rest and rejuvenate. But it's also one of the commandments that are most often broken in church. We don't think a thing of it, but God is serious about it. He says, this is in the top ten, baby. You got to learn to rest. You got to figure that out because it's going to catch up to you. You're going to wind up in the valley if you don't. But we've got to rest. We've got to Look at that. Write this down. Rest is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. He took it very seriously. He knew we would need it. All the commandments are for our good. Every one of them are for our best. And he says that's one of them. But busyness will put you in a valley. And here's what I noticed. Here's what I noticed about things. Let me just say this. Since I'm not talking to you one-on-one, I'm just kind of spread this out and just kind of spray a lot of people are busy and they're tired and they are they put a lot out and when they choose to rest sometimes is they choose the day that's supposed to bring them rejuvenation at church and that, but what they're really tired from is not church it's a pretty good pretty good uh, sign that the rest of your life is too busy if you've got to use a day that you're supposed to be serving the Lord in whatever capacity that is and and that's a pretty good sign if you're tired from that pretty good sign that you're too busy you're too busy i'm gonna move on but i wrote this down too sometimes the most holy thing you can do is to take a nap amen whoa getting pentecostal in here celebrating naps i love it you were just listening right but seriously eat a good meal and go to sleep But here's the deal. Believers usually rest wrong. We rest wrong. I mean, I'm I'm pointing the finger at me. If I could, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. We rest wrong. We should be the most rested people on the planet. Not lazy, but rested. We are the most productive when we're rested. Right? But believers should rest the best. If you're a believer... Maybe that's not uh, the topic of some of your uh, sermons you've heard in your life. But God calls us to rest. He goes on to say, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached uh, Horeb or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. It's got a nickname. It's a reputation that God's there. There he went into a cave while he was there. Went into the cave while he was there and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him while he was there. He said, what are you doing, Elijah? Elijah gone to the desert. He's pouting. He's ready to die. And God says, look, you need a sandwich. You need something to eat. Sorry. So in this place where he is, this is extremely, extremely important to your walk. This is the same place where the Ten Commandments were given by Moses. As a matter of fact, most people think it's the exact place where it was, where God's glory passed by him. 
Because it doesn't just say they went to a cave. It says he went to the cave. That means the cave of the mountain. Everybody knows where this is. But Elijah goes to this place because he knows that's where God, look, I'm in a valley. I need the Lord. I need to hear from God. I need some direction. I need some encouragement. I need some movement in my life. And he knows exactly where to go get it. And he, it's where God has shown himself before, and it's on this mountain. So, number two, if you want to get out of the valley, we're going to try your best to stay out of one. Listen, position yourself in God's presence. AJ said it earlier. I thought, man, he might as well just preach the rest of the day. Because he said the same thing. Those students have positioned himself. It wasn't just going to camp thing, although that's awesome. It's a great camp. That's why we send our kids. We don't send no shabby place. But I'm telling you, the work was done before they got to camp. I'm telling you. And it was over and over again, those students, and maybe it was you parents that decided, I'm going to get my kid where I know God is heard, where he is preached, where he speaks. So every Wednesday night, our students go in there. Hey, every Sunday morning, if you love your kids, you'll have them in church. I don't know a more loving way to say it, okay? I say it with love. Somebody bet me I wouldn't do this today, and I did it, so I just won 10 bucks. But if you love your kids, listen, you'll, you'll put them where God is. You'll position them in his presence. And you know where he speaks. He speaks here. So just get yourself, position yourself where God's word is spoken and where he is. Get him in his presence. Again, there's a tendency for people to pull away. Not just from people or church or God. Maybe it's life group. But the enemy tries to get us pulled away from where we know he's, we're going to hear God's word. There's something about it that's going to be spoken to our heart. Instead of running away, he goes to, a, to the cave on the mountain. Because he's very sure that God is coming. God, He will meet God there. In fact... This is in the text. You go back and read where it says Elijah heard a great wind, uh, like a tornado came. You know, heard all the noise of a tornado. Then, right after that, an earthquake, and he heard a lot of shaking and rumbling. And finally, he heard a great fire, like a roaring fire, you know, like you can hear when a big fire is. He heard all that, all this noise, right? All this noise. But he wrapped himself in his cloak and he went to the mouth of the cave. And the Bible said that he, that God spoke to him in a small still voice a gentle whisper because back in those days it's interesting that back in those days that that's how people was the obvious sign that there is a God that God is present was all those things but sometimes he speaks to us in a small still voice that's when we're praying with him to him and we're reading about him He'll speak to us. But some, some of us, we don't unplug enough of from life, sometimes literally, uh, to be able to hear God's Word. So here's the last thing I got for you. If you want to get out of a valley, listen. Let God change your perspective. Allow it. You do that, again, by reading His Word. That's how you start to take on characteristics of God and the direction for your life. It's, it's, there's nothing... Y'all do know uh, that's why you know how to read. Not just for your job or so you can read the mail or read the paper. God said that we could read so we could read his word first and foremost. And it puts something in us. It changes our perspective. Verses 14 and 15, just before this, God says, what are you doing here? And this is his response is, listen. He replied again, I, he keeps talking about himself here. Listen, it's all about him. I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and torn down the altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. They want to kill me too. It's I and me and I and me. Then the Lord said to him, he changed his perspective. I got to get this off of you. You're always talking about how this is affecting you. I'm going to give you some direction here. And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Stop running. Get back on track. 
And when you get there, I got work for you to do. I want you to anoint this guy. I want you to anoint this guy. And I want you to anoint this guy. I've got a lot of work to do. I know you're scared. I know you've been in a valley. But listen, I want to get you out of that valley and back on track. And luckily, God doesn't give him a hard time about his selfishness, talking about himself. But God gives him a new purpose. I know you've been worried about you, but listen. There's a job to do. There's an assignment specifically for you. And listen, that's the same thing for us. God has a specific assignment for you and for me. And he rallies us together so we can kind of encourage each other and celebrate each other and cheer each other on. I want you to go here. I want you to do that. I want you to anoint this guy. So he gives him two things. And I think he gives us two things. Two things. He gives them a purpose and he gives them people. I think he gives us all purpose and people. He gives us a purpose for our life, an assignment, a job, a duty that is assigned by him, and he assigns us people to do it with. That's why some of you love to work with kids. You love to, you say, that's who God wants me to affect. He wants me to work with kids, and he put me in a position to work with kids. He skilled me in that way. Some of you are so good at so many different things. He's giving you a purpose. And he's also going to attach people to it. And that's how we do. We, we, God says, you know, I want you to pour into these other people's lives. I want you to make their life better. Listen, if you're trying to get out of valley, uh, here's a million dollar advice. Learn to serve. Find a way to serve people. Find a way to get connected. You don't have to wait till your, your situations are perfect. It's your circumstances are ideal to learn to serve and to get connected. Have you ever heard of the term wounded healer? Wounded healer, most therapists, most people that do help for people say, hey, I'm a wounded healer. I don't have it all together. But part of my healing process is helping other people. Because if I can help them, it helps me in the process. God's doing so much. It's not busy work. It's with purpose. So some of y'all to break your neck finding a way to get to guest services to find out what are my opportunities to serve. God's calling me to serve. I just don't know where yet. We'll help you. We'll help you figure that out. So listen, Elijah, Elijah, he came out of his valley when he learned to do, to listen, to respond to what God called him to do. Now, he could have kept running. He could have said no. And it sounds like he was closer to the end of, the, end of his life than, than what he meant to be. You can say no. But listen, he said yes. And he went and did exactly what God called him to do. Listen, what's God calling you to do? It's hot in here. You're hungry like me. But listen, don't fall for the distraction. What is it that God wants you to do? What's the steps? Are you in a valley? Listen, would you stand with me? Would you go ahead and stand? I, I, hope, I hope that you're on a hill in your life. I really do. I hope it's awesome. But listen, we can't sustain a hill between every hill is a valley we all go through it and so many people fall off they don't know the Lord like they thought they knew him they're not, because they're not as committed as they thought they were God wants you to step into his plan and listen that's not what you fear that's what you should embrace is his calling on your life so listen there, there is so much life change going on around here some of it you see because we like to celebrate it like we did this morning. But there's so much growth going around. I don't want you to be left out of that opportunity. Our church is moving and going somewhere. We are doing things. And God wants to use you in the part of the process. And he wants to bring you out of that valley. He wants you to bring other people out of their valley. We're a family here. We're, we're responsible for each other. And so I love you enough to say, even if I hadn't met you yet, I love you enough to say that, that God loves you. He's already demonstrated that with his son on the cross. He just wants us to say yes to it, to respond to it. 
So how would it feel to have your debt paid, to have, not to have that hanging over your head, not to face a, a, a eternity without God? Listen, it's better than that. What would it be like to be able to do what God's called you to do, to be freed up from what people think and only have the audience of one and that God's so pleased by you that he has this perfect plan set up for your life. It's better than a plan that you can come up with on your own.